Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. This is your host, Howard Fox. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, and access and enjoyment of the great outdoors. Our guest today is Terry Creekmore. Terry is a Livermore, Colorado-based outdoor enthusiast, conservationist, and freelance adventure writer. Terry, welcome to the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Good morning, Howard. Appreciate the opportunity. Fantastic. Now, for our listeners, I met Terry actually last year, last fall in Vermont. He kind of stood out because he's this tall, handsome guy. He's got a lot of swagger. And he has this wonderful cowboy hat. And I ran into him again a couple of weeks back in Casper, Wyoming at the Outdoor Writers Association's annual meeting this year. And Terry, it was so good to see you at the OWAA meeting. And you still got that swagger and you still have the cowboy hat. Well, first of all, let me tell everybody my wife doesn't refer to it as swagger. <laughs> You know something, I don't exactly know if we have a PG audience, an R-rated audience, but you can, we can decide later what swagger means. But I, I mean, you look pretty good in that. I mean, I got to tell, I think I would disagree with your wife. I think you got that swagger going. So you don't have the hat on today. I've got my bald head, but in any case, it's so good to see you in. What was your takeaway from the Outdoor Writers Conference this year? Well, it's an excellent meeting, actually. It's really nice to meet people in the industry. I'm, I'm new to this thing since I retired as a wildlife biologist. So I think I've been in the organization for 10 or 11 months now. But, you know, there's people in that organization I've been reading since I was a youngster. And it's kind of, kind of neat actually meeting them in person. I think that is interesting because you and I, I mean, we have been in this OWAA for about the same amount of time. I am new to the outdoor writing, creating space via this podcast. And I, I, lo I love the fact about the OWAA is they've been around for 95 years. And as you just said, when you were a kid, you were reading uh, some of those same people, uh, work of some of those same people. So that's actually pretty cool. Now, before you retired. Now you, you, I know you spent some time in the air force as a master sergeant. Did you go right from the air force into working for the U S fish and wildlife service and the Wyoming game and fish? Well, the first part of the air force is active duty. And then I went to college. So I was in the air national guard the rest of the time. So yeah, I spent a lot, a lot of time at the air force, but most of it was the air national guard and I decided I needed to be a wildlife biologist. So that kind of took precedence. Okay. How did you, when you were growing up and first, where did you grow up? I grew up in Northern Montana on the high line, pretty close to Canada, that part of Montana that California is not buying because it's certainly not in the mountains. Okay. And growing up in that part of the world in Montana is funny. I just was chatting with somebody yesterday from Montana and there's a lot of Montanans, I guess that's what you would call them in, in our organization that we're a member of. But what was it like growing up as a kid in really this sparsely populated, very open space part of the world? What was it like? Well, the first thing was that song, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, never made any sense to me because you just look out the window. But, you know, it's a little town and I had a few sidebars as a youngster. I think I could not leave town. It was below zero and I had to be back by dinner. So at seven or eight years old, I was prowling the prairies around Shelby, Montana with my little 15 pound bow searching for jackrabbits. Yeah. Fifth. Now I, I will admit to anglers. I've never fished in my life. I want to take care of that. Uh, I've never, I've shot bows before in, in a archery range, but is a 15 pound bow, is that just big enough for a young kid or is that, is that a substance of bow? Well, I'll tell you how big it is. I jumped a jackrabbit at close range one time and, and flung my one arrow at him 
and he outran it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. How did uh, this growing up in this area in Shelby, how did, what aspects of the outdoor adventure life did you really kind of, I don't know, cling to or really get more passionate about? Because there's so much to do when you're an outdoor enthusiast, when you're in a, in a place like Montana, there's a lot of things you can be doing. What was your preference for the outdoor activity? Anything outdoors. So I spent a lot of time in my home range as a child was only limited by lack of a water bottle in the summer and cold toes in the winter because my snow, my snow boots were Congress high tops with bread bags in them. Oh, wow. So, you know, I, I continually expanded my home range with my one arrow, but it's, that's just the way it was when I was a kid. Okay. Okay. Well, it, it, I, you made it this far. So obviously you were doing something right. When you decided, when you had left the, the Air Force and went into uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where did you, how did you get this interest in, in wildlife and wildlife diseases in working in that, that area of, of the outdoor world? Well, it was always kind of at the back of my mind. That would be a neat profession. And one day I was sitting in a transit facility in West Germany. There was a West Germany back then. And there was a magazine on the counter. It had been there a while and people had cut out ads with their knives and stuff. So I read most of a story about a, a guy from the army who got out and became a game warden. And I couldn't read the whole thing because there's chunks cut out of it. But it kind of stuck with me. So when I got out of the Air Force, I thought maybe that's what I wanted to pursue. When you when you left the Air Force then and you decided on that pursuit, how difficult was it to get into at the time the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? I mean, was there did we have veterans preferences at the time, or did did they look at you and say, "Yeah, you look about right"? How'd that work? Well. First of all, it's amazing I ever got into school with my under with my high school grades. But the reason that I got a job with the Fish and Wildlife Service was because I volunteered in a National Wildlife Refuge for three years. So out of twelve people in our class, two of us got jobs in wildlife, and we both volunteered for three years, and they pretty much just found us temporary jobs. Well, that's pretty opportune. Now, where was this National Wildlife Refuge? It was Laguna Atascosa in South Texas. Laguna, say that again. And it's a neat place down there. I mean, it's scrubby. It looks like, I don't know, it looks like it's got alopecia, but boy, does it have some critters. Now, what was it like working in this, the, this type of field? Well, when I went down there, I was the new guy. So I did the grunt work, whatever nobody else wanted to do like the weekend birding trips because there's a lot of people who are serious birders down there and so i ran those but i also got to help with some neat stuff like telemetry on ocelots because there's ocelots down there but i was working down there in a temporary job and these folks from university of georgia vet school arrived and they were doing a wild pig disease survey around texas and I was assigned to be their faithful Indian guide. They needed to shoot 10 pigs to conduct very in-depth necropsies. So I went out with them and I ended up shooting eight of those 10 pigs since I seemed to have a propensity for shooting running pigs. And the, <laughs> job, the job interview was, you want a, you want a job going around shooting stuff? It's like, yeah, I can do that. So next thing I know, I'm, I'm in Georgia at the vet school. When when you were offered this job, obviously you had a propensity for shooting stuff. Was this because you grew up in Montana and with, well, you had your bow and arrow, so I don't know how good, I imagine you were shooting guns back then as well. Oh, I was shooting whatever I could find bullets or arrows for. And you know, I, I started out on the shooting end, but then pretty soon you got to do the disease end and that's. That's pretty rigorous as far as training goes. And between on the job training at graduate school, I kind of got it figured out. So what was the, so the, you got the shooting end. What was the scientific end that you were involved with then? Well, it, 
depend well whatever species like on wild pigs we're looking for diseases that they harbored that might translate to domestic pigs or domestic livestock so we would do necropsies that would probably take an hour plus per pig i mean very in-depth a lot of microscope work blood work his, histopathology it's it was the deal did you have to take this data that you were collecting and then write up reports or papers and do presentations? Oh, some, but you know, I started out at the bottom rung. So basically I did the field work and other folks did the writing. Okay. Now, when you went from there to the Wyoming game and fish, what was that transition like? Well, the first part of the transition was the national wildlife health Addison, Wisconsin. Okay. So. I worked up there for eight years ah. and between Georgia, when I was at the university of Georgia, they worked in 14 Southeastern states, plus Puerto Rico, plus whatever the USDA and USDI wanted. So the first year I worked down there, I was on the road 40 weeks, 40, 40. Yeah. We were down in Hossaba Island, wrestling pigs, taking samples from vesicular stomatitis. This is an island with six people no bridge you got to take a boat spent a month down there came back on a friday evening and there was a note on my desk that said take this box of stuff with you to hawaii when you go monday and there was a plane ticket and i went to hawaii for nine weeks <laughs> were you married then no no okay yeah because i would think that if you were the wife would have an issue with you you've been away all that time well, my wife actually worked at the same place and we eventually got married and we traveled a lot between us. Yeah. One, one time I was down in Puerto Rico, net, helicopter net gunning deer, and we flew back from Calabria and we were in San Juan and our driver got in an argument with some other guy in a parking lot. And my wife, who was my fiance at the time, walks by and she didn't even stop. It's like, I didn't know if she was down there. She was down there doing Puerto Rican parrot work. So I asked her later, I said, why didn't you stop? She said, oh, they were arguing. I didn't want to get involved. Ah. Yeah. And then one, one time I met her at the Chicago airport, just passing. It's like, hey, let's get a Chicago dog. And then we went our separate ways. Okay. Wow. That's it's like two ships passing in the night with each other. What, had you done any writing, significant writing or thought about it as you were in this career, working in the, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the up in Wisconsin, the, the Wyoming Game and Fish, had you done any kind of writing? Had that uh, there been a spark there for you? Well, the writing I did until recently was all science-based writing, publications for journals, which are really boring unless you have the correct kind of geek to read them. So I kind of just started this outdoor writing stuff recently. Okay. And what has been the, you know, the reaction to some of your writing? I mean, do you, are you just you know, kind of sequestering yourself in your office? Are you going out on the field? Where are you getting your kind of your inspiration from for your writing? Oh, well, most of the stuff I'm writing now is from experience, experiences I had in the past. And I wrote a fiction novel. Every writer has a fiction novel on the, on the shelf. That's the next great thing. Of course, nobody wants to publish it. They don't know who you are. Of course. So, yeah. Yeah. I got into magazine stuff to try to get a little experience and name recognition. And you've been written up a couple of times and I, I was reading some of the articles in the bugle, which is the Rocky, was it the Rocky mountain elk foundation? Correct. And to tell us about some of those stories. Oh, the first one was the first one I ever sent into them and they, they bought it. It's like, well, this isn't so hard. Yeah. But I found out later it was anyway, that story was about an 87,000 acre fire, wildfire that burned everything, but our house in Colorado and watching the, watching the habitat regenerate with no trees, which animals came and which new ones moved in, which ones you never saw again. And, and they purchased it. So I was off and running. Wow. And how long was this article? 4,000 words, maybe 4,000 words. Okay. That's something to live. That's something to aspire to. I think is 
I'm like hoping for maybe 500 words plus a podcast that you and I will talk. I'll, I'm going to be learning some lessons from you. And what was the next? Uh, well, let me ask you a question. You mentioned the house. I was reading that fire flames in the future. Now, is you're, are you sitting in the house right now? I am. It's still here. It's still here. And you, cause you probably had uh, the deep wells or some type of sprinkling system, I would imagine. Cause that's pretty amazing. It's still there. Well, back then in 2013, they didn't put sprinklers on houses. Now they try to put sprinklers on houses, wildfires. So, but I was just kind of left them all the resources. And the first thing they do when you get the old oh crap call to evacuate immediately is they shut off the power. And when they shut off the power, there goes your well pump and there goes your water. Wow. So I had a generator set up and I was actually at a sage grass conference and steamboat Springs were giving a talk on using unmanned aerial vehicles to monitor sage grass. And I got the reverse nine one one and we'd been, we'd been evacuated for two weeks and we put everything back in. They let us back in. We put it in the morning before everything, but the forces. And then the fire jumped the river and just started burning everything. And I get there, had to go to Laramie, get rid of my game and fish truck, drive all the way down here. And this woman who was running the fire, I said, can you go start my generator? Cause it was, it was a crown fire. It was burning. It burned 48 houses the first 30 minutes. But she said, jump in the truck. And we drove up my half mile long driveway that ends in the national forest. And she said, we can't stay in here cause your driveway is the only way out. You got 30 seconds to start that generator and it started on the second pole and off we went. And wow. The, the that is. Yeah. The two fortunate. sprinklers. Yeah. The two sprinklers saved my house from burning. It got hot enough. They were putting out enough mod water, big tripod sprinklers that it was built between the logs and my walls, screwing up sheetrock and it still got hot enough. and melted the insulation on my foundation. Oh my, that's amazing. And with the, and so you, you created this story and from your perspective, what, what has been changing in this area around you in the, the parks and in, in, in your land, what are you seeing is this environmental evolution of wildlife? What's going on out there? Well, shortly after the fire, we had some rain and there's no trees, no vegetation to stop the water. And it was just the little. The little uh, canyon by my house, it never even had a trickle. It looked like the Poudre River the first time it rained. Washed out the culvert in my driveway and there was gullies washed out feet, feet deep just because there was nothing to stop it. And there's been no tree re regeneration since then because the fire burned too hot. But the understories there, the mountain mahogany and the mule deer, that's, that's like candy for a mule deer and the mule deer population probably doubled after that mountain mahogany sprouted. It's kind of slowing down now, but we still have no trees. So the elk that used to hang around here, they have no place to hide. So when they come through, they just kind of pass by. They don't live here like they used to. Mule deer, there's a lot of those. There's some bird species that didn't come back and some that replaced them. But things like Ebert squirrels, little black squirrels with your tufts, they all died in the fire. They can't outrun a wildfire. That's a crown fire. And actually during that fire, it was when the fawns were young and the elk cows were young and they were in the hiding phase and they just never came out of the fire. We would go around and find little piles of bones where they just curled up and waited for the fire to come. Cause oh, they wow. anyway, it's, it's changed the world. I mean, we can see a lot more. There's no trees in the way. Now we see bighorn sheep instead of as many elk. So, I mean, it did change the habitat. Okay. So you, you could probably get into some painting or photography as a result of the, the, this changing wildlife coming past your, your windows. Well, yeah, if, if I had any talent that direction. I, I imagine you have lots of talents there, Terry. So you don't sell yourself short there. I am curious, right above your shoulder, there's this pit, uh, drawing that was one of the images in the, in the articles, in the mag in the bugle, what is that image? That, that is my mule jitterbug. And then that story was about, I shot an elk one time in my, I used to go in with horses and then you have to spend half your time messing with horses. So 
Now I just carry what I can on my back and live like a coyote, but I've got a spot transponder. And the, the message every night to my wife is I'm okay. And it gives her a Google earth map with a pin stuck in it. But the message for her, for help is bring the horses. I'm here. So okay. I shot the elk and she showed up with one mule and a horse. And we quartered the elk and put it on those animals were walking out. It just, it snowed the night before worse, nasty old muddy, wet, slushy snow. And it was steep and that mule got froggy on my wife and kind of pushed past her and got loose and took off running across the steep hillside and stepped on this lead road. So she started rolling down this mountainside and she rolled 50 yards, which is fairly spectacular. But then she started rolling head over heel and every about third time she'd hit, she'd bounce about 20 feet in the air, like a tumbler. And finally she hit this ponderosa pine and I thought, I'm, she's got five broke legs. I'm going to have to kill her with my pocket knife because my rifle's in the truck. And the whole time my wife's running down the mountain yelling, whoa, jitterbug. And I told my horse Chester, I said, yeah, it's a little, little late for that whoa stuff. Anyway, <laughs> we get down there and my wife says, cut the lash ropes on the pack that was holding the meat. And I said, I don't want to cut my lash ropes. And then she convinced me I didn't want to cut my lash ropes. So I cut them, took the meat off, mule stood up just fine. The pack saddle was trash and the, and the meat stayed down on all the way down. So it was a heck of a pack job. But every, every time after that, on the way out, I had to hang the meat up and come back and get it the next day with another animal because the pack oh. saddle broke. But my wife would tell Jitterbug to woe, and she would just pay for luck. She is a, <laughs> she's an outstanding woer to this day. Wow, that's that's amazing. What other writing is is kind of going on for you right now? I know you've 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 got the memoir. You're, it's, at least the transcript is going to be up on the shelf behind you until we find you a publisher. We'll get that. We'll we'll help you get that. What what else is on your what are your plans now for some future writing projects? Well, I've got that fiction novel, but then I've also got the memoir of my 36 years as a wildlife biologist and folks that the meeting always referred to when they were in J school, which is journalism school. Yeah. But I didn't go to J school. I went to W school, which is wildlife school. So I'm not really a journalist. I'm just a storyteller with adequate punctuation, but. This, this memoir is just 75 anecdotes of working with wildlife around the country. So anyway, that's, that's sitting there on the shelf. But recently I sent some stuff to Meat Eater. They, they requested some articles and I'm trying to get some stuff into outdoor life. So I'm trying to expand my horizons a little bit here. I have no doubt that your uh, horizons are going to be expanded. And, and by the way, I didn't go to J school and I did not go to W school. I went to, I don't know, P school, but psychology and public administration. And I, I got into podcasting kind of as a, as a solution to a client's problem, but that's all, that's not about this podcast episode is not about me, well, but I love I, it. But the yeah. fact is we're coming from different backgrounds. That's okay. Yeah. But are you psychoanalyzing me here? Am I psychoanalyzing? Not in the That's slightest. Cool. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I am, by the way, very opportunistic, Terry. I'm thinking, I want to come visit you in Colorado. I think it's got to be beautiful up there. And I'll, I'll sleep, I'll bring my sleeping bag to sleep in the barn or something like that. We could probably do better than that. Uh, all right. All right. So when you're being retired, the, there's the R word for you. And you've got the writing. What else do you do for fun? What does Terry and, and his wife do, do? What do you do for fun? What do you guys do for fun? Well, I do a lot of hunting and fishing. My wife has yet to retire. So she gets kind of grumpy every morning when she's got to go to work and I'm sitting at the house. But we try to travel a little bit. Yeah, we try to get out as much as we can get to the mountains because they're right there. Yeah. I, I was looking at the map yesterday because as I was prepping the notes, I was saying to myself, Livermore, I've got to check out where it's at. It's like right next to the a national park and it's got to be gorgeous up there. So that's not a bad place to be. 
Well, except for two fires recently have burned almost 300,000 acres of that beautiful between here and Rocky Mountain National Park. So the world is changing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least at this point, you, you both are adaptable and you're making the, the best lives that you can. And that, that that's sometimes that's the best we can hope for. And it's, it's been a pleasure just to kind of get to know you and at, at the OWAA and Hopefully our, our paths will cross even outside of the, the conference. And by the way, tell your wife, you have swagger. I, I, and by, I would like, but if you could, wouldn't mind sharing perhaps a couple photos that you have taken in the area, especially one with you in the, in the cowboy hat, because I got to prove to my listeners that you got the swagger going. Well, if I didn't know that, I'd have worn my cowboy hat, but it would uh-huh. take up half of the frame of the picture. So I didn't do it. Yeah, it w- for the our listeners, yes, it would. Now, right now, you don't have a website, and we get, and so you're going to share it once it's it's completed. Because now that Terry is a famous freelance outdoor adventure writing author and and aspiring novelist, we got to get him a website that's being worked on, and we'll provide that backlink on our show notes once it's done. But Terry, it's been a pleasure to have you spend some time with us here on the outdoor adventure series i i hopefully this is as painless as I shared with you that it was going to be and it'll be fun it's like having a a beverage with a friend you haven't seen at least in two weeks so well it's like having a beverage with a friend and then the conversation can be edited no i don't i try to do very little editing in my conversation so that would be, unless, of course, you gave us the other name that your wife says instead of swagger, but we're not going to go there. We'll leave that for our listeners to figure that one out. But thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate the opportunity again. Sounds good. Well, listen, stay on the line. We're going to do a quick close and you and I can have a final chat. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, folks, we have just been chatting with Terry Creekmore, outdoor enthusiast, conservationist, and freelance outdoor adventure writer, and had the great pleasure back last year in, oh my God, I can't remember where in Vermont we were, but I know the colors are beautiful. Had a chance to chat with Terry at the conference, actually at the airport as well, as we were both heading back home in our respective airplanes. And he was at the conference up in Casper, Wyoming this year and had a chance to really sit and break bread with him. And really fascinating story that growing up in northern Montana, fishing with the little teenager's bow and just how he has went on to have a, a great career for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Wildlife Service up in Wisconsin and again in the state of Wyoming. And now on his retirement decided to put some more words on paper. And now he is an accomplished freelance writer, having published numerous articles for The Bugle. And he has some more in the works for some of the other uh, publications and mediators and some of the Trouts Unlimited, I would imagine. And there's any place else where there's hunting, fishing, and he probably doesn't do very much hiking uh, like I do. But, you know, something we all have our our preferences when we, when we talk about outdoor adventure, and we certainly appreciate him joining us here on the show today. Now, if you enjoyed this episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series and our interview with Terry, please visit us on the OutdoorAdventureSeries.com website, and you can also find us on LinkedIn and Facebook on the Outdoor Adventure Series pages, and we are on all of the podcast directories. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day. And we will see you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now.